habituation, familiarity. Okay, like, like right now, I uh, I have a beautiful home on a hill overlooking a mountain. It's private drive going up. It took me two years to find this place. I had to make an offer to get it. Boy, I used to take people on tours of my house and my property. Oh, they just, when they come, they just amazing, amazing view. I don't even notice the view. Okay, it's called habituation. Newness and beauty, new, it, it stimulates high dopamine. And I've been there. I've done it. So that's a dynamic that's built into our brains. Okay. It keeps us looking for more. See, part of life is to build and to grow and to look for more. Yeah, to, uh, to evolve at the end of the day. Oh, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it's a natural phenomenon. So the brain will habituate. That's what happens. We don't want to habituate to our partners. Welcome back to another edition here on Mentor TV. I'm Patricia Falco Beccali, your host, and we've got Dr. John Gray back on the show. You know him from previous shows, and thank you so much for all your questions. I'm here together with John to dig right into them, give you the answers, if there are any straight answers with relationship or relationship management. You do know his book, uh, we presented it last time, Beyond Mars and Venus, and it's a fundamental reading, Mars and Venus, you know, I, I think 20 books ago, which was an eye opener for me. John, thank you so much for taking the time again for me and our Mentory TV community. I'm so happy to be with you. Always a pleasure. Oh, listen, I've got a stack like this of questions just for you. And that, of course, after uh, we had our awesome conversations about Mars and Venus, about relationship, what a woman is like, what a man is like, what they are like together, um, about Mars and Venus at work, we talked as well. But there are specific questions that seem to come up over and over. So I collected them over the last few months. And one is, for example, okay. I'm a woman, he's a man, I learned from Dr. John Gray how to be a woman and thus create, co-create my relationship. But what happens if one day I just wake up and look at my partner and say, I don't like you anymore, I'm totally off you, I don't want this. Is that a phase? Is that something to be taken seriously? Is that something that shows you you're actually at the point where you need coaching, where you need um, therapy? Well, some people can't do it themselves and they need a therapist and they need a coach. Uh, I rarely recommend therapy because often what therapists do is they have you just complain. <laughs> it, it just reinforces that you're in the wrong relationship and you're powerless. And unfortunately, complaining and feeling powerless is addictive. Just like being powerful, dominant is addictive. Being powerless is addictive. And if you get your power, feel good from being powerless, you're creating a, a wiring in your brain that sabotages any relationship. We should all feel confident that we can get what we need. But the problem is we, we expect too much from our partners and we don't take enough responsibility for what we're putting out. Mm -hmm. And I have to say this in a compassionate tone. Every man in a relationship, when he com comes to me and says, my wife's just not happy, what can I do? I mean, I used to love her, but I don't feel anything now. Well, you can't feel anything now unless you feel successful in a relationship. For men, success that I can provide something of meaning to her rather than fail her over and over will numb him to his feelings. And so he has to do a behavioral shift and see that it works. What he was doing doesn't work. Logically, if you stop doing what doesn't work, men are very logical. <laughs> then, then show me what I do wrong, and you give another chance to a man, and he gets a result. Then he's motivated, he's encouraged, and then liking his partner increases. So that's one aspect of the whole thing. Now, giving a woman the same strategy doesn't always work. It's number two strategy. Uh, for the woman, when you wake up and just don't like your partner anymore, that's always a sign always a sign of suppressed anger, uh, suppressed disappointment, feelings, emotions. See, when, when women suppress the emotions of dislike, then they just basically are stuck in feeling, I just don't like him anymore. I'm not attracted to him anymore. And, and certainly there's reasons why you can be not attracted to a man. I don't want to discount that. But if we're looking at, you know, he's pretty much the same guy. I just don't like him. It's because you've gone through... Um, 
uh, something I wrote about in one of my books is called the four R's. And I see relationship go through these four R's again and again. And uh, the four R's are resistance, resentment, rejection, and repression. And that you really, when you're not, not liking your partner anymore, you're pretty much uh, into the third R, which is rejecting them. You know, I don't like them, therefore, I don't want to spend time with them. But the first R is resistance. Your partner does things that actually in the beginning, it wasn't a big deal at all. Like in my marriage, it would be, I'd leave lights on in the house. Okay, I'm, I'm absent-minded. I'm a little bit more messy than my wife. I'm more preoccupied. It's kind of like the absent-minded professor. Uh, when I'm writing a book, I can't think of anything else. So so things get messy and, and I leave lights on. And in the beginning, she's always re- make excuses for me. Well, he's doing this, he's doing that. But when when that little activity, that little thing that causes a resistance in her, she, you know, it's a little thing, but I don't like it, but I'll make I'll make excuses for it. If it persists over time, then it turns into resentment. This is a mechanism that's automatic, which is, well, I don't like that. Then what the brain starts doing is, well, I start to, I, I do this for her, him, or he says, her, well, I'm doing this for her. Why is she reacting that way? We start comparing mm-hmm. ourselves to what our partner does for us. Mm-hmm. As soon as you get into that comparing, well, I do more than you. Well, I leave the lights on and you put them out. And therefore, I, you know, we start feeling the sense of entitlement that I have a right to be unhappy with my partner. Because see, really, we all want to love our partners and everything. So we have to sort of give an excuse. You know, suddenly I'm, 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 a man's, suddenly I'm just an awful person and the woman's, I'm such an awful person. So we have to excuse ourselves. This is what humans do. This is a part of our brain is like seven years old. Well, I hit my brother, but he hit me first. Because then we can justify, I'm still a loving person, and I would be so loving if he would do the things I, <laughs> like normal people do, okay? So we rationalize ourselves as loving people, and therefore we then get caught into resentment. And they don't realize that whenever you're resenting somebody, you're not loving them, okay? And we think, oh, I'm, I'm see what, it's loving someone that brings out the best in them. Yes. Not loving them doesn't bring out the best in them. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's for a man, the way a man feels love is by feeling acknowledged and appreciated for what he provides. And a woman feels love how how he provides for her. Yes, but but coming back, if I may interject there, which I think is very interesting, taking your example of not switching off the lights. Okay, that is, um, I think, in, in terms of resistance, where you go like, hey, it's natural to switch off the light, it's a waste of money. All right. So she's, she's looking after the family. And also, why can't you remember? Why it, exactly. I can remember. It's so easy for me. Why do you discount me? And not understanding that for some people, they don't remember certain things. And it's not and for I the just, person, but it's yeah. just because. Uh, but women, maybe men as well, take it personally. He's like, I'm asking him and he's just completely ignoring it. There must be something, you know, that, that, oh, it, that it, triggers that. Exactly. Something triggers that. And and we should look underneath men and women. There's a biology which the men are always looking for reassurance that they're successful. Uh, I look at my bank account. I look at my stocks. I look at my my how many books I'm selling. You know how many people attend my workshops. Who wants to hear me? Are people clapping for me? <laughs> it's it's a natural thing for us to look at validation of my success, and then we have validation of our worthiness of love. Okay, worthiness of love is not so much how many books I've sold, but am I a good person? And women are constantly looking for, biologically, it's fueled by estrogen, looking for reassurance that support is around me. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Uh, and that reassurance would be men hugging her, a man acknowledging her. You're beautiful. Switching off You're the lights, so- John? Say that again. Switching off the lights? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So she asks would you turn out the light? And it, to her, it's such an easy thing. And he won't even do an easy thing. Then can I really depend on him? Can I trust him? Will he be there for me? And then ironically, because women don't understand men, if he won't do something little for me, how can I depend on him to do something big? Because it is a little thing, but over and over, is he responding to my request? If he won't do something little, how can I ask him to do something big? But that's the way women think. 
Yeah. Right. You know, look at the details and kind of like extrapolate it. If really, you know, things go wrong and I need him, will he be there if he can't even provide this little thing? And men might think exactly the opposite. Oh, my God, what are you getting upset about? This is nothing. You know, look at the big picture. I'm paying for it. You know, I'm paying <laughs> yes. for the bill. you know, that's right, the yeah. problem. Uh, uh, <laughs> so. And now having said that, it kind of sounds like the man's right and the woman's wrong, but she's not. She's feminine. And he's basically has to understand sensitivities that women have. But does that mean I have to become a woman? No, I can't be. But what I can do is when she's upset about that, <laughs> I can say, I understand why you're upset about that. It seems like I'm not really there for you and I don't care about you. But tell me more how you feel and get her to talk more and when women can talk about what they're feeling without somebody saying you're making a big deal out of nothing, because they are, they are. If you, but if you say that, you're dis, you're extinguishing the part of her which needs to be heard and seen. And when a man can hear what she's upset about or bothered about, there's other things too. You see, it builds up. It, it's a build up. It becomes a way. Let me find out what I can be upset about. Yeah. And. Yeah. So let's look at those four R's. So I finished that with resistance, resentment, rejection, if resentment builds up mm -hmm. and we don't take responsibility for our resentment. See, the, re the resistance is we need to take responsibility for let's work out a system here where we can be understanding of this. OK, I, he doesn't do the light. So let's have a conversation about it. Let's work out our feelings on it. And so it's not so bothering and, and realize resolve it at that level. And we'll learn how to do that today because some women wake up and they just don't like their partner anymore. Our husbands just don't like their partner. So you've got this resistance level. It shifts into resentment. This is very important. We start comparing. I remember stuff for him. I do this for him. See, that's where the rub comes in is we start comparing. Then after we feel resentment for a while, a phenomenon takes place where we start feeling incompatible. Mm -hmm. I call that rejection. Mm -hmm. And he suddenly... You know, maybe he likes Rocky movies uh, or, you know, Marvel comic movies. And she doesn't. But when you're dating, she doesn't mind. OK, we can go to a Marvel comic and, and he doesn't mind taking her to the symphony if that's one of her preferences. You know, it's fine. I'm happy to go along with that. I'm happy to go along with that. Suddenly, we're not happy to go along with our differences. Our differences becomes incompatibility. Yeah. Well, you know, you just don't want to do the things I don't want to do. And this really shows up in sex. Often, if she's in the mood, he's not in the mood. And when he's in the mood, she she's not in the mood. Just the fact that I want something, you want something else. And this is what couples do. They get into these, well, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to go there. But I want to do that. That becomes important for me. You know, I remember one relationship where I changed my music for my partner. <laughs> but when I ended the relationship, I realized I don't like this music. I'm going back to my music. <laughs> but was it natural for you when you when you fell in love with that person? Was it natural for you to just kind of like, oh, come on, give over. She likes that music. I like her. I want her to like me. So I'm going to repress, as you were That's saying right. earlier about women, I'm going to repress my liking or disliking for what she actually likes. Right. But it's not even so much repression in a bad sense. I'm still getting pressure. It? It's just simply like it's a loving okay, gesture at like the beginning. It's yeah. generosity. It's like, OK, no big deal. I can go do that. And that's without the resentment. Once resentment sets in, we don't have that flexibility. We don't have that generosity of what well, she likes to do that. I'll do that. Or he likes to do this. That's OK. Well, he does, you know, things that I don't relate to, but I love him. We lose that ability and we start to reject our partners. That's my dog running around. I, I love it. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> What's her name? Uh, Mimi. 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 <laughs> oh, what if I hide Mimi? <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, so once you've been in that state of rejection, but you continue not being obvious about it. OK, a lot of times, you know, I don't want to seem that way. We still keep trying to be generous when we're not feeling generous. Mm -hmm. That then those are feelings of anger and hurt and reject and, and fear, insecurity, mistrust, doubting, all those things. We're still trying to look good as opposed to what we feel like doing is walking out the door, just rejecting our partner. Yeah. So we stay. And that's what happens to a lot of people. They stay in a relationship, but they have no feelings. They repress. That's the fourth one. If you have this sense of rejection, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do my thing. 
Because see, if you actually reject, you look pretty selfish. You know, you pr look pretty ungenerous. You know, you want to have sex. Why well, don't want to have sex? And you realize that's kind of not generous of me. <laughs> Uh, you want to go to the movies? I just don't want to go anymore with you. But you used to. Yeah, but I don't want to do that anymore. So we don't want to look, we never want to look bad. Okay. We always want to rationalize we're the good person in the relationship. See, that's back to the resentment stage. Yeah. I'm I'm better than that part. I'm one up, you know. <laughs> I'm better than. So now I'm if I'm better than in love, then I'm a victim. And if I'm a victim, then I suddenly just don't have generosity to give. You know, if you've been cheated over and over, you don't want to give more. So you stop giving. So that's rejection. And then if you stay and you don't correct those things, then your feelings get repressed. And that's that day where you wake up and just go, I just don't like my partner. Yes. Yes, there's absolutely. Nothing, just like there's nothing. It's repressed. Yeah. The thing that that generosity, the love, the caring, the sharing, the uh, respect, all the good qualities of love are gone. And, and, and we kind of go, what happened? I don't know what happened. What happened is you went through several stages, which are inevitable. Yeah. And each of those, it's not like over 10 years that happens. That can all happen in a day, but it's just one brick of repression. So I talk about, you know, let, let's just say, I remember I was just analyzing this as one time, it's like, let's go to the movies. And she goes, well, I don't like the movie. I don't want to go to the movies. And my first reaction is, well, I don't like that, you know, now I don't get to have fun with my wife. And then that's the first thing. I don't like that. Then I'll go into, well, I do this for her and I do that for her. That's my resentment. And then, and then well, then I don't want to go with her. I'll just go with my friends and I don't care about that. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. And I'll just come out of the shower like everything's fine. That's in one minute I can go through that if you have self-awareness. Yeah. So you not liking to just numbing yourself. Call, we'll call that one brick of the four R's. Then over time, you get another brick and another brick and another brick, and you're building a wall around your heart. And that's what happens when you wake up one day and you just, I'm done. I have nothing to give. I don't, I don't like him. There's nothing. You're not even upset about it. You see, that's a different kind of, I don't like when he leaves the light off. You get upset about it. If you're getting upset about it, at least there's some emotion in there and you can go through those four R's, but there's a place where people just go numb. Yes. And that's after many, many bricks yeah. around their heart. And what do you do about that? Well, you can go start a new relationship and you have no nothing around your heart. So you feel like this is great, but those bricks are still in there and they will be triggered. Uh, they will come back. Uh, it just will be with another person. You'll overreact to things. You'll say, oh, he's doing this. My other one partner did that. And you'll react stronger. Yeah. You know, if, if so, you're going to have more concern, more worry because those bricks are still around your heart. Now, the solution is if you can take one brick out, another brick out, another brick out. And it's a gradual process. Like I have some clients that will spend a year in counseling with me. Uh, what we're doing is basically <laughs> taking a brick out. I help them feel good. And then well, something will happen. It will bring up issues. We'll take another brick out. But each time we're rebuilding trust that I can get what I need. And I know what my partner needs. I, she knows what I need. And we can rebuild that trust until the heart, until all those bricks are gone. And that's what therapy could potentially do. Our coaching obviously does, you know, they do two different things. Coaching is more like strategies, mm -hmm. setting goals to make change. And therapy theoretically is going to help you to process the emotions because, and this is more important for women than men, but it's also important for men. Mm -hmm. So when a woman comes into counseling with me, what I'll do is something similar to what other therapists will do. And that is, Let's talk about what's going on. But I'll never leave them in that state of victim. It's so not how, how do you handle how do you how does um how do I have to imagine my session with Dr. John Gray? So I come with my husband. Well, well, okay. well, well if there's problems, okay, if somebody just wants <laughs> No, no, no. Problem. Absolutely. There's a problem because we're at the stage where let's say I wake up and say, I don't like my husband anymore. And yeah, I went yeah. through we the know, four we Rs. Know, we know that wall is there. So we, we know that to... wall is there. He doesn't know what has hit him, <laughs> you know, literally. That's and he's right. like, I don't know what happened, but can can you help us, please? Because she tells me something you know, I have no clue about. Please enlighten us. So, so how do I have to imagine your session? Well, if we talk about a session, remember, not everybody can afford a session, has the time for sessions. And they can do self-help work, which is, you know, I'm trying to help people do it themselves. But some people really do need somebody else. And... 
And that's also, let me just say another point here and we'll come, do you hold that idea? This is a really important thing that's happening today on the internet. Hmm. Is that when people can be anonymous, this horrible person comes out. This is not healthy for the person reading that and not healthy for the person who's doing that. Anonymous expression is unhealthy for your brain. Uh, literally, you see, the difference between humans and animals primarily is that we have self-reflection. I can see myself. Now, how do you increase self-reflection? Relationship is the only way we learn to re self-reflect. You have to learn these things. We have the potential as humans to self-reflect. But you can't self-reflect alone. You have to look. You look so beautiful today, but you also looked in the mirror. I, I, my hair is too long, but I looked in the mirror and I poked my little hair back here. So I look very presentable. I look very nice. That is because I'm in a relationship. I can see myself. You have a well, spirit partner. You can reflect. You have yeah. to be in relationships to see yourself. Now, to see myself as confident, I'm in a relationship at work. But to see myself as intimate, truly, deeply lovable, I need to be in a relationship with somebody else. And anybody who's not in intimate relationship does not really know who they are and they can't. They have an illusion. They're in denial. Well, you okay. see, my, my mom, that, well, that was great. She said, uh, you know, I was a very late bloomer and a late, uh, late into the dating game and everything that is with it. And she said, look, Patricia, you have to start dating if you want to be a good wife one day. I'm not saying, you know, you have to kind of go around and, and have them all, but have solid, maybe not too long relationships. But you have to find out who you are and you have to, with that process, also find out who you kind of can enter a bubble with. And, you know, grow together, if to say, you know, what you need yes. from the man, what you need from the relationship and what you can give. And only then one day, you know, you actually be able to have a long term, more solid, grown up, re reflected relationship because you know yourself better. And she didn't tell me to go out and slut about, but she said you need to actually do this as a self-development if one day you want to actually be a mature, long term partner, wife or whatever. And, and and also another thing which you just said that maybe is not relevant to the people listening to us today, but it's happening in the world, is the denormalization of family, the denormalization of heterosexual relationship, because that's what creates babies. Okay, you can't have babies, you can't have a family. And ultimately, without a without a family of literally children that you're responsible for as human beings, we never even learn how to be unconditional in our love. Yeah. And this is these are states of, of fulfillment in life, you know, to find unconditional love embraces yourself. So you're not striving, you know, workaholics, never feeling good enough. People who take drugs, addictions, all this plethora of crazy Sodom and Gomorrah activities that are happening in the world is literally denormalization of loving families. Yeah, I mean, I, I always say to my husband, you know, I think we are the odd ones out because we are so freaking boring and traditional, you know, in the <laughs> way that we have our values, how we live our relationship, you know, it's just, it's just so normal. It's like, all right, I think we are the odd ones and we joke about it because we love the inclusion, we love the diversity, but sometimes you actually end up feeling the canary in the cage. Well, yeah, well, it's a rare thing today. I mean, we're, we're no longer the... And ironically, we are the majority, but we seem like we're the minority because there's so much attention on the minority. Uh, the Grammys, uh, last time was just satanic rituals out there. I'm just crazy stuff. People, you see what happens when people are bored in their lives, they need something new and different, dangerous, immoral activities, to overstimulate to feel alive. Dopamine, 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 dopamine. Because dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. they're not getting it in their relationships. Now, what's interesting, and I know we're getting off the subject, but since we covered that one, I want to say this. We want to get out of our addiction to dopamine. Dopamine is addictive. But why we, we like dopamine, one is that on one level, we like dopamine because it creates uh, uh, excitement in the brain. It creates a feeling of alive. It's a motivational hormone. You know, yeah, you get it, you want to mm, okay. continue. But nobody understands how, and I'm going to present this as, my understanding of what's good about dopamine is that dopamine in men raises testosterone. It's testosterone that motivates us, not the dopamine. It's in men, it's the dopamine, if you're a man and you have male genes, 
testosterone will go up in the presence of dopamine and testosterone will create aliveness and motivation and all your best qualities as a man. Now for women, what dopamine does is it will raise your estrogen. Okay, think about, oh, I'm in danger. Oh, who can help me? See that when you look for who can help me, that's estrogen. Now, if there's nobody in your life that can help you, then you'll go over to, well, then I'll have to do it myself and your testosterone will go up. But biologically, when testosterone goes up and estrogen doesn't, women are not happy. Men can go up testosterone and they're very happy. <laughs> so we're biologically, genetically different programs. But one thing is consistent is that dopamine raises testosterone, dopamine raises estrogen in women. Now, why is this so important? Because in a relationship, dopamine only lasts for a short period of time. That's called the honeymoon period. So then people get too comfortable, they ease, they lose the excitement and the passion and the aliveness they felt before. But actually, you don't have to have dopamine to produce the aliveness and the, and the loving feelings. If you have communication skills from the woman to the man that will raise his testosterone. And if the man has communi behavior skills, it's more for men, more behavior skills, behavior skills that will raise estrogen in women then suddenly you have that aliveness and you're not dependent upon the newness. And so you can then sustain the attraction that you felt in the beginning and love can last a lifetime. And I think this is so interesting. And let me pick up on what you introduced the idea about being, I would call it toxic online. You said anonymous, you know, you start being a, you know, that beast anonymously well, online. With anonymous. It, you know, you will say things online that we would never say to that person personally, because we would be considerate of how it's going to land. We can consider it to the circumstance, how appropriate this is. We would soften it. But when people don't have that reflection of how you're going to sound to the other person, there's nobody else there, then craziness happens inside of us. And grows and grows and grows. Yeah, and, and it's kind of like it's not it's not being pruned. But I think there are two interesting aspects to it. The one thing, and I would like to stay also with the dopamine kick. And I was wondering about, you know, us being in a world these days that is constantly overstimulating us. We are getting signals from everywhere. So we are, and this is why we, we take that mobile, we take it again. And, and, you know, we look at it 183 times on average a day or whatever the latest statistic is. And every single time we do look at the screen, there is that dopamine hit. So it is the addiction that you were saying. So with that, how can these days really a partner um, uh, compete with this because so often you and I, John, I'm sure you had the same, we go to a restaurant and then you see the couple and they're young. They must be somehow maybe in love, maybe not, or whole families and they're all on the devices. So they are together, but they're not. They're like, they're like digital zombies and they're getting their dopamine kick from whatever world they entered through the screen rather than from a nice conversation, actually connecting with eyes, with touches, with laughs, with do you remember, and getting those feelings that then really connect because they may be sitting together, but they are actually somewhere, one is in Australia through the, you know, through the screen, the other <laughs> one somewhere in Hong Kong, whatever. But how does, how does that really impact our ability also to stay connected on an analog level with our partners or potential partners, if we are constantly having this competition for being stimulated by something else. And it's well, actually fun. And, and, and I, wrote, I wrote a whole book on that, on ADD and brain function called Staying Focused in a Hyper World. And so these are some of the ideas. It's that book right over there, called okay. Staying Focused in a Hyper World. And, but the, the simple concept is habituation familiarity. Okay. Like, like right now, I, uh, I have a beautiful home on a hill overlooking a mountain. It's private drive going up. It took me two years to find this place. I had to make an offer to get it. Boy, I used to take people on tours of my house and my property. Oh, they just, when they come, they just amazing, amazing view. I don't even notice the view. Okay. It's called habituation. Newness and beauty, new, it, it stimulates high dopamine. And I've been there. I've done it. So that's a dynamic that's built into our brains, okay? It keeps us looking for more. See, part of life is to build and to grow and to look for more. Yeah, to, uh, to evolve at the end of the day. Oh, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural phenomenon. So the brain will habituate. That's what happens. We don't want to habituate to our partners. <laughs> exactly. So, 
Yeah. So, so that's why we have to have something else in our relationship that produces testosterone and estrogen in women. Estrogen in order, estrogen and testosterone is like the yin and the yang, the opposites, and those opposites will create attraction. And again, if you get the big rush of dopamine, something really is new and different and challenging, it will naturally produce those hormones. It's like in the movies when there's this, when the man rescues the woman <laughs> and there's they have great sex afterwards, you know, but when the woman well, after rescues- After a fight, after a fight. It's, you know, a couple fight, fight and then they end up in bed. I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> it wouldn't work for me. Well, fighting is another dynamic. A fighting is danger that will produce those hormones and you get to then express the emotions of those hormones. And so it's a lot about processing emotions. But once again, it's in a unhealthy context where you realize after that big fight, you don't want that to happen again. Uh, and so you start becoming more wary of the line minefields. So once again, you uh, too much avoidance going on rather than connection. And it's, again, we're talking about we're really going a big circle, but coming back to what therapy is like, often when you go to a therapist, therapists just ask you to talk about what you feel. Now, particularly for women or men who are out of balance and more on their female side, which is not as many as women are supposed to be on their female side, talking about what you're thinking and feeling will produce estrogen as long as somebody is validating you, uh, validating you. And that will lower your stress levels. Now we know that when women are stressed, their estrogen is low. When women are stressed, not stressed, their estrogen is much higher. So if women can just talk and somebody hears you, estrogen levels go up, you feel safe. You feel like I can depend on my therapist, like my coach to hear me. I can't depend on my husband, but I can depend on my coach. Okay, so you're in there. And so you're just complaining about anything. And what therapists generally do is say, tell me more, help me understand that better and you're right. Uh, people need to be validated. But what I understand, and most people don't, most therapists don't, you can validate somebody and not agree with their victim status. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What that means is, let's say you say, I feel like my partner doesn't love me. He ignored me. He did this. And therefore, I feel so unloved. I feel so hurt. Whatever. And a person says, yes, you're not being loved. As opposed to, yes, you feel hurt. Yes, you feel sad. Yes, you feel angry. Yes, you feel ashamed. You see, what we have to do as therapists is help people get to their emotions. And then, then we can go, yes, I understand that emotion. If I thought what you're thinking, I would have that emotion too. But I don't agree with what you're thinking. What you're thinking is completely wrong. But people I still really understand how you feel about it and what you would. Okay. And, and not even how you feel. See, yeah. feeling is a, feelings are not facts. This is like a revelation for people. People think if I feel it, it's a fact, okay? I feel my partner doesn't love me. All you're doing is believing. Yep, once again, my partner doesn't love me. You're affirming a, a belief that's very limited. He may not have loved you yesterday, but maybe today he is. Yep. You can't look at a, a feeling as a fact, but people do because, again, look at it logically. Well, it, for you, it's I, real, it, John. It, in the moment that you feel it, I mean, you do feel that emotion. So you think... What you feel. Now, here's the thing. Most people... Emotion is different from feeling. Feeling is the capacity to know something. When I feel something, I'm knowing something that's not depending upon evidence. It's what I feel. So if I feel unloved, if I feel like a failure, if I feel like I'm not good enough, I feel like you don't love me, my brain thinks, well, that's true. Absolutely true. And then it looks for confirmation. So I'm kind of like monitoring you through this perception. That's right. It's always looking for confirmation. That feeling is not a fact. We have to realize, don't look at your feelings as a fact. See, if I read something in a book, I read this in a book, okay? So it's external information. But then what do I believe is what I believe inside. And that's what a feeling is. A feeling is a knowing. I know I'm hot. I'm not dependent on anything outside of me. It's I'm knowing internally. So you can know internally my thoughts. That's kind of like I feel like when people say I feel like they're they're internalizing. I I know this to be true within me, with, regardless of what anybody says. Everybody says I'm good. I feel like I'm not good. Okay, that's and you can't argue with me because of course I feel that way. So the brain gets caught in feelings. Does it gets locked there? Only way to unlock it 
And then somebody says, yes, I understand you feel that way. And tell me more. Tell me more why you feel that way. You're just giving more reinforced. Re, you're uh, validating about the negativity that? rather than validating the pain that that belief that you're feeling is causing you. I can, you know, somebody can say, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened. And now I feel so sad or I feel so angry. I understand if I had that happen to me and I believe the same things you believe that I'll never get the love I want, for example, then I would be afraid too. So I can validate the emotions. Emotions are all, is what people feel emotionally don't have content in them. You don't want to validate content. You want to validate the, the, the emotion, which is a reaction to the story you're telling yourself about what happened. Exactly. It's, it's and that very, is very, this is called emotional intelligence is to be able to take any, any negative feeling has a negative emotion linked to it. So a feeling is I feel like nobody cares about me. I'm, uh, I feel hopeless. I feel like my husband does that. He'll do it again and again and again. I'll never be free. So this is just bad propaganda. And you repeat it over and over and over. It just reestablishes the belief. So many therapists will just listen to what you're feeling, an occasional emotion here and there. And what you've just done is confirm, put it in stone, I am a victim, I am a victim. Which then when you leave, ironically, this is the problem. Being validated as a victim, powerless to change, okay? Powerless to change. Validated for that, you still feel validated. And when you feel validated, your estrogen levels go up. Somebody supports me in my my crazy story. I tell myself that I can never get the love but I want. Does this I, that help you in your relationship? No, it doesn't help you at all. It just gives you, it's kind of like the same thing women get out of therapy is what men get out of porn. Mm -hmm. When you produce, when you go online as a man going to porn, what happens is you feel totally alive. Like you're beyond anything you can ever have in a marriage, by the way. It's different, but it's the, the dopamine of it is much greater because the fantasy is when a woman is undressed and when there's 64,000 women on one website all saying, I'm ready to have sex with you, that sends a message to your primitive brain that you're king of the world. You're the alpha monkey. You're the one. I and that's to say, amygdala. <laughs> it's like, yay. <laughs> all right. That's, that's the status of king. Let me give you in the monkey community. When a monkey goes from beta, see, there's always the main king. And then when he dies, the betas will fight a bit and one becomes the head. Okay. As soon as he gets the status of king, all the females are attracted to him. So that's even more status. But as soon as he becomes the king, his testosterone levels will double. They will double. Yeah, now, it he reinforces a, physically it, and chemically, basically, itself, the position. But, and we look at this epigenetics and, and, and science, which is when you get the message from society that you are really good at something, then your testosterone levels go up. And once again, that's another a way to keep men's testosterone levels up without depending upon the high dopamine. Now, the high dopamine of, of pornography, for example, is much higher than the dopamine you can experience, except in the first months of a relationship you will get that newness there but online you're not only getting newness but you're getting digital newness now digital newness is missing all the ingredients of reality because it is fantasy it's not real when things are not real then you have uh you don't have counteracting hormones for example if if we're in a relationship and we love each other a lot of serotonin is being produced mm -hmm that we're at ease and comfortable with each other. You know, I'm just my safe zone. So I can come here. Uh, there's oxytocin being produced. Yeah. Couple, yeah. Mm -hmm. so there's all these other hormones being produced in a real relationship where you're with someone in the physical. But when you're not in the physical, you're not producing pheromones and you're smelling your partner and you're being touched by your partner. See, this is oh, all kinds are not of, in. Mm -hmm. that keeps your dopamine levels for both a man and a woman from going so high. But these are counteracting forces. And so if you're online and it's just new and different and it's sexual, your testosterone just shoots up, your dopamine shoots up, and there's nothing to counteract that. And it's literally like you just took cocaine. Yeah. Now, what happens is it's notorious. We learned about this in science with cocaine. 
habituation happens right away, which means it will never, ever be as good as the first time, according never to cocaine. Enough. It's never enough. Yeah. And the brain is always trying to recapture that by taking more and having more. And that's called an addiction where you keep trying. And biologically, I like to explain this one thing for people to really get what habituation is, because the word, you know, I gave an example of like now looking at my mountain isn't so beautiful. However, when I go to China and teach for a while, then when I come home, suddenly the view is more beautiful. It's never as beautiful as the first time, but by the way, however, if I bring somebody new and different into my house and show them the view and they see it as new and different, I then see it as new and different. Absolutely. And that happens. I think we can all relate to that, John. When we have, we live in a city and it's a beautiful city, but yeah, habituation kicks in. And maybe you have not even done the tourist in your own city, even though you move. That's right. You do that with your friends. Exactly. And you're like, oh my God, I live in such a cool town. Thanks very much for coming by, you know, and you kind of discover. This is by relationship. Seeing yourself through the eyes of others is so important. And if you want to grow as a human being beyond our own selfishness, And I'm not judging selfishness, you know, I love to be successful and I love this, but what even more fun is to be selfish and then generous. And that generosity is an aspect of unconditional love. And you don't get unconditional love until you're in a relationship which requires it at times, which is to forgive, to accept, to take responsibility for your side of it. So many things we can learn to keep the love going in a relationship so that then We can make babies and babies really bring us into the place of unconditional love. Uh, And these are like stages of life, okay, that we need to evolve into. And most people are just stuck in their own selfishness and their routines. And they're so bored by that that they want to take drugs and do crazy things. Yeah, mood shifters, mood shifters, getting into And But, you know, what I, I really would like to pick up on, and that is... Uh, basically, that you that what what you said about uh, newness and habituation, all right, and the newness. So, um, and and also not feeling loved, or somehow your partner triggers something in you that you feel also rejected, or somehow out of that one bubble, one of you steps out. Maybe you step out because you feel hurt. Now, I'm sure you know Gabor Mate. He is very much into you know trauma, um, researching yeah. trauma, written fantastic books, and. And the subject of trauma, we all, he says, we all are traumatized, you know, especially in the first seven years of our life. And we we carry this energy and whatever it is and however we kind of also did self-development and are actually quite complete uh, individuals entering, let's say, a relationship, a marriage, still without knowing your partner may trigger that trauma in you and then cause a reaction where you're, all of a sudden you, you're like back to whatever, whenever that trauma happened to you. What do you say to that? Is that something that you've seen also in your uh, in your practice with people where you say, hey, this is not about your partner and what they do. It's about what they even lovingly do, but is triggering a trauma within you. Well, that's it's not your partner may trigger your trauma. <laughs> inevitably, inevitably. They do. <laughs> my partner is my trauma. <laughs> my, my thing is 90% of any upset, whether it be with your partner, whether it be with your job, whether it be with friends, 90% of any upset that lasts more than a few minutes. Okay. If you get out of it in a few minutes, it's just about present time. But any any uh, <laughs> anything that really you're gripped into it, 90% of that is your past. Now, I use that as a beginning philosophy. It means nothing until people can actually experience that. And, re- and and so that's what I help in therapy. So we'll come back to that whole idea of the therapy. The first most important is just sitting in front of somebody who validates whatever you think and whatever you feel as, you, as they just ask you questions. Uh, if you're a woman, that will produce estrogen. You will feel good in the same way a man can have sex with somebody online or with a prostitute. And while he's doing it, will feel good and afterwards will not feel good. Okay. It's an addiction. And so that's what most therapy is. It's just simply validating a victimness, which feels good to express your victimness. But if you don't, and the second part of it, take responsibility with new knowledge on how I'm contributing to the situation or how I could have adapted to the situation in a conscious way rather than an unconscious reaction that perpetuates the problem. 
So it's simple. The way this would look is in, in practical terms. That's the idea. A woman would be complaining about her husband and he was, uh, you know, she still remembers not just her childhood trauma, but in the relationship 10 years ago, he threw her out of the car. Okay. That doesn't get forgotten. That's PTSD. And as soon as she starts to open her heart more in the relationship, what's going to pop up is I can't fully trust because he did that to me. And I was powerless. I was powerless at that time. So then we'll work on Mars Venus principles. Mm -hmm. Mars Venus principles are strategies to make relationships work. And so it's not just about emotional healing. That's one aspect, but then you have to have strategies. So in that situation, I would first help her go express those emotions, produce some estrogen and have greater awareness of what she feels inside. And then we'll look at the situation and she'll feel better. Then we're going to look at, but put yourself in that situation. Let's see what else you could have done at that time that would have avoided the outcome. Yeah, every argument, <laughs> you know, all I have to do is, so tell me exactly what happened in the car. He said this, but she said that. And then he said this, and then she said that. And then she said, he said that. She escalated. He escalated, without a doubt. But when she understands, what could you have done differently? Well, what am my wife? What do I do with my wife? If I say anything that's upsetting her, she just holds the handle of the car and I stop talking. That's a learned behavior. Oh, okay. So basically you have like a time out sign, line, whatever. Let's not, yeah, not, we, let's not yeah. escalate beyond. And then, so once I teach That's how to me. stop escalation, mm -hmm. then I'll say now, next time your partner's starting to get a little bit angry, I want you to have a, a safe word. And in their case, the safe word was you're being insensitive and then walk out of the room. And I've talked to the husband and whenever she says you're being insensitive, don't follow her. That's an agreed upon behavior, which they can practice. And then she starts to realize and actually experience in her body that when he's starting to lose control, I I tend to make it worse. That's all all you have to do is resist somebody and we'll get, you know, if I'm doing this and you do this, it just intensifies. So you have to be able to stop it. How to stop it? She has to practice in the relationship with her safe words saying, well, you're being insensitive and walk out of the room and he doesn't follow and that's it. Or he realizes he's losing control and she does it. And he says, look, I'm getting upset. Actually, he doesn't even need to say that because she'll say, why are you upset? <laughs> okay. Exactly. That's <laughs> yeah. So he can just simply say, I hear you and I need to think about it and I'll be back. Famous Arnold Schwarzenegger. Phrase, I'll be back. Okay? I'll be back. Be All back. Right. <laughs> I need, <laughs> so I need to think about it. So you're not judging someone. Nobody, you don't want to push people down when they're already out of balance. Yeah. So uh, I need to think about that. We'll talk later. Uh, but that's again. extremely mature and grown up. And, you yes. know, it, and, 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 you know, this is this is I, I get the scene. So they drive in the car, they get upset. She she drives him so mad with, you know, the, the conversation back and so forth that he just pushes her out of the car. Just get out of here. I get this. And, and, and as a woman, I could even see, OK, maybe it was also my responsibility. And it always takes two to tangle. Always, for takes, example, two. It always takes two. But what about, for example, if. If uh, a woman comes to you, John, and says, my husband is porn addicted, you mentioned it before. And I just thought I had this question also. So what if my partner all of a sudden goes into some sort of addiction? We've been together. We've been OK. Things have been stressful. And all of a sudden I found out found out he is addicted to porn online or sex, whatever. How do you as a wife uh, or partner deal with that? Because maybe your partner didn't even tell you. Yeah, so he doesn't know that you know that you found out that I, I mean this are these are these are very realistic situations. How how do you as as an expert communicate with whoever get you know comes to you, be it the man that says, Hey, I'm I'm having this, I can't tell my wife, or the wife saying, Hey, I found this out. Where are we in our relationship? How are we supposed to handle this? It's such a hard hard addiction is a very hard thing. And the only you have to draw a boundary with addiction. But you have to have good communication about it and understanding. Now, if I work, I, I do this with couples, okay? If I'm working on both sides, I have to explain to the man that his addiction is shutting his wife down. And I have to explain to her. And the bottom line is, you know, where, where you're going to get to and tell you, stop, I don't want to have sex with you. So, so yeah, you that's have to couple. basically put... You know, put them in a corner and say it's, it's either like a, or. If finally. you're going to drink to the point where you're violent, I don't want to be at the party with you. Okay. Now that's even with little addictions. I don't really have addiction to drinking, 
I have a, more of a, a tendency if I drink to be the center of attention. I am. You incredibly... always the center of attention. What are you talking about? You don't need to drink. <laughs> I, well, no, this is me not being so funny. I did a, I got a, a Broadway show, the most successful Broadway show in history, uh, financially, just because I had no props. It was just me in the biggest theater. And I just stand up there and do comedy and relationship. Okay, it's very funny stuff. People want to test a taste of that. Uh, my uh, TED Talk with the red shirt is pretty much great. Oh, I, I look at that one. I haven't seen it's that one. It's very though. funny. Everybody thinks this guy's a comedian. Well, it's very funny. I have a comedian inside of me, but I'm really a serious teacher, so I don't go too far that way. But give me a couple of beers. <laughs> Way out. <laughs> I, I can tell because I'm traveling to China. I'm traveling everywhere. I got stories to tell. Every day is a story if you have a sense of humor and, and you make fun of things. And so here I am at parties, and my wife was just, he's dominating the whole conversation. We're not getting to know anybody. She used to say after the party, she says, So what did you learn about anybody tonight? I said, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> they all learned about me. <laughs> That's not, not proper socialization, John. And, and then I said, well, how does it make you feel? She said, it makes me feel unincluded. And so I said, okay, we'll solve that problem. Because you don't want to try to change me. I don't want to try to change you. But if I'm making you feel uncomfortable, because I want you to be uncomfortable, I want you to be comfortable at a party and enjoy yourself. So if you can't enjoy being with me, just take one person and go into another room and have a conversation with them at that time. And but the truth is, I do this without any self awareness, and also people lead me into it. They just keep asking me questions, and they laughing. And what about yes? So I'm not everybody's got excuses for what they do, but actually, I didn't want. I want to practice not doing that. So anyway, then so I would be at a party if I'm drinking a little bit. And rarely I do, but I would watch her go into another room, and I go, oh, okay. Now ask. I'll just ask somebody a question and get them off of me, but. I was able to see I made a mistake without being punished. She wasn't leaving the room because I'm a bad person. She's going into the other room because she's getting what she needs because she likes to get to know people. And I I was just getting and to know people. And there was one person that wasn't so captivated by you that actually- The only person. No, she just said, they're always going on again. He's going on again. And everybody else is loving it. Yeah. But that's, that's rude behavior from her point of view. And it is from one point of view. All those people didn't think that, but- there's a reality of our relationships where she wants to get to know people and we get to know them and we're there. So, so rather than be a, a foolish man and go, hi, why can't I be myself in a party with my wife there? I realized I can be myself to audiences all the time. Why do I have to be my, be that part of me? Cause I've got many parts of me. And this is, this was an important realization. And, and a lot of men listen to this talk, Patricia. And so they, they're so good at what they do at work. And when they come home, their wives don't seem to like clap at everything they do. You know, they're not like waiting for the end of every sentence. And a man, his attitude, he can interpret it the wrong way. He can go, well, everybody else thinks this. Why don't you think this? And no, you just, you're just needy for agreement and validation. So God gave you all those people because don't expect that from your wife. A wife is not going to just... She knows your whole history and she's dependent on you for her survival to various degrees, for her security. She can't react that way. None of those people are depending on you that way. So it's a different dynamic. And rather than resent that your wife can't give you what other people are giving you, embrace the fact, well, I can get that there, but this yeah, is what's yeah. appropriate in an intimate relationship. You're certainly not having sex with all those women. You're getting to have sex with this woman. Hopefully. But it's interesting because a friend of mine, you know, her, her husband is uh, is also on stage. And I said, so what is he like at home? And, and she said, you know, he's always on air. He's so what? basically, he's always on air. He is, whether he is on stage, on the radio, on television or at home, he's always the same. He's always on air. It's always about him, his stories, and he's just, you know, there's never a, the persona that is a professional persona, and then the persona that closes the door, comes home, and is the family man. So she really, but she said, okay, it's him, I married him, I knew it, and that that's, it works for her, okay, it works well, for her. But here's what she's going to miss, what she's going to miss out there, mm -hmm. is she may think it works for her, because she's made it work for her. That's what love does in the first stages of resistance, and then but resentment creeps in because she's not necessarily getting what she needs. And I don't know the whole case, but you can accept that in him as long as you're getting what you need. 
And what women need is somebody who will take time to penetrate her, not just sexually, but penetrate her emotionally. Yes. And this is what's so missing today. I mean, literally, it's rampant everywhere, which is women's stress levels are double what a man's are at work. This is on averages. And when she comes home, it doubles again. The reason it doubles again, and even if she's single, the feminist one to say, well, she comes home to a man, no matter, no wonder. (laughs) (laughs) What a killer. (laughs) It comes home because in her physiology, okay, she doesn't turn off the stress of work. Mm -hmm. Men's physiology does. We're designed to go full force and then rest. Women are not designed that way. You cannot be full force and then suddenly take rest. If you're a mother, when you're a mother, there's no rest. There's no time to stop. You've got to, literally, you've got to be burning fat all the time to have unlimited, not intense energy, but a stream of energy. Whereas men particularly don't burn the fat. We burn the muscle energy, which is, it's intense. And then we need to recover. On and off, on and off. Mm -hmm. It's on and off. We were designed to be that way and we can be off for long periods of time. Women can't be off for long periods of time uh, in terms of they did brain research on women at Harvard and they told women to relax on a couch and her brain sped up. And you ask her what she's thinking about, all the things she should be doing that she's not doing. And, and men have this beautiful couch. nothing box, I learned. That's once. Right. That, nothing box they there. actually are in the nothing box, whereas yeah. as women trying not to do anything, it actually sprouts big time. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it's not as strong as it is, you know, if a woman is more in touch with her masculine energy, she will have a bit more of that ability to turn off. But still, she's an mm-hmm. overwhelm. Yes. She will be an overwhelm. Uh, and, and the way she, she turns off, what she turns off, is her emotions, her feelings. And that's kind of the point I was trying to get to is that as much as I t- talk about, you know, women, you need to talk about your feelings. If you ever have a woman come into my office, I now tell me what you're feeling. They'll be so superficial. They'll just, well, I feel like this and I feel like that. And he didn't do that. And they'll just tell story about what happened, what didn't happen, what could happen and what he should have done, what I Sometimes they'll do what I did, rarely do they, but they do. But they're just talking about superficial. What produces estrogen, and that will produce a little bit of estrogen for sure because somebody's hearing you and validating you and interested in what you're saying. That's all good. But the key to it is go deeper than you go, go deeper than you would go with other people. So you're in the workplace. There's a lot of emotions you have when you're working with other people that you just ignore because you can't express them. They have no purpose. So what's the point? It'd be like a man. I remember flying in an airplane with my wife who doesn't understand men at the time. And there was this man and my wife wanted to get him to talk about his feelings. And he says, feelings, what's the point of that? You know, there's this and there's that. There's not, feelings don't do anything. It's, like, it's amazing. Not, okay. And what did you, I mean, you were knowledgeable at that time I just explain to him, don't ask him what he's feeling ask him what he thinks Thanks. it's as simple as that i was doing a show with oprah one time and she was learning to be trying to be a therapist <laughs> she never succeeded because she she would basically say so how do you feel and how do you feel and women would just complain and if the husband was there she said now how do you feel and it'd be like he was constipated uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and i didn't I said, have bowel oprah. movements today i don't exactly. feel so good <laughs> <laughs> so i said to oprah just ask the question, what do you think? And as soon as she said, what do you think? The guy can, well, I think this is wrong. And I think she should have done that. And when I married her, I was doing this. Why does it all change once we're married? I mean, why? who gave me these rules that I'm suddenly supposed to follow? He had so much to say, but ask him what he's feeling. That, that was not his MO. Now, some men can go to their feelings, just like they're more producing more estrogen in their life. Uh, estrogen is when you don't have to do anything to get food. Uh, I mentioned before, I just want to mention an amazing story, a research thing I just heard today, yesterday, I, uh, inspired me to write a book, actually, uh, this study. Uh, so a new and, book coming out by well, Dr. John Gray? inspired me to write a book. It will, it will be called uh, Genetic Diversity. Okay. Uh, everything inside of us comes from our genes. And everything I talk about is the range of the genes in men and the range of genes in women and how the what's happening to us today is what's called genoestrogens, xenoestrogens, 
is suddenly there's these chemical substances that are coming in from outside and changing our gene type. Okay, a gene expression is the way you would say it. So the gene expression, things that make you want to look pretty, things that make you want to nurture children, the things that make you want to uh, keep your house orderly and clean, those are genes, right? And they need to be expressed. Well, there are certain, there are certain uh, substances out there that are actually suppressing those gene expressions. Okay. And that makes women more like men. And the same gene expression actually makes men more like women. And I've always explained this, but now there's a study with rats. And what they did is they created a whole city for rats where all their things are provided for. Okay, they didn't have to hunt for food. Rats are always looking for food, right? You got to look for so food. So they were living in paradise. They were there. Yeah, they're living in a paradise and they studied their social structure. And after a period of time, all of the male rats became gay and all the female rats did not want to have sex anymore. Uh, and all they thought about was themselves. They became very much into how they look and compared themselves with other rats and they were taking care of themselves. How and did you at... study that? How did you interpret it in a rat's behavior? How, well, how, the rat, I mean, that they today, became vain. What's happened? The, the females became incredibly entitled and vain, but had no interest in males. And the males had in sexual interest in other males and they weren't interested in the females. And this was genetic changes that were occurring due to what's called uh, epigenetics. You epigenetics, change the environment yes. mm -hmm. and gene expression inside of us changes. And, and this is called social engineering. What's happening right now is some people have the idea that we want to social engineer people uh, and what's the outcome going to be. Well, the outcome of the rat study is they all died. They because they weren't making yeah, Of course, there was no procreation. The women just died off and the men went. No what babies. Had, if you don't have babies, babies, the generation in. We all die eventually. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we want the planet to go on. And there's this, this idea in the world that we have too many people. Actually, we just don't have enough wealth for everybody because they're selfish people. And and even Japan, for example, the population is going down, 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 down. America, the population of Americans is going down. For the down, first down, time, down. yes, yes. They want the people to come in mm -hmm. to repopulate because people are just not having babies like they used to. You need to have two and a half babies, something for a population to grow. Mm -hmm. And usually it's one baby now because it's so expensive. There's not enough wealth. So anyway, having said that, the problem is that they didn't have a, a task of survival. They didn't have the usual crap we have to deal with in our day-to-day -day life to provide, but that keeps us male. That's, that's, the, that's the study for rats. Now, we're not rats, okay? But rats need to have, uh, need to be in a mode of survival to depend on each other. Now, let's look at the history of hum humans. Mm -hmm. We, we, if you look at the relationships between men and women, historically, women could not, without birth control, Women could not have babies, I mean, and survive without a man. And that was just, that's the reality. And even today, if we can upgrade that, women have babies without a man supporting you are not happy. That's the research, okay? Just the massive amount of unhappiness and stress that women have. And they could fight to their death saying, well, I'm happy with my child. <laughs> they're just, they're, 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 their war cries, I'm overwhelmed, too much to do and whatever. They, they're, they're not happy. We can see this statistically. Whereas men are not productive, that's what's happening today with the males. And there's more gays. <laughs> what's going on is, and you can see this and kind of go back 50 years, if your father was a millionaire, which was a lot in those days, generally the son became an alcoholic, a drug addict that never got, never could stay married and was wanting to have sex with many women, could never anchor into one woman. See, all these promiscuous behaviors Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah behaviors is all because, you know, we live in this abundant world, you know, it's the fall of Rome. Uh, everything, they were so they abundant. They didn't have a purpose, and, didn't have a task, didn't have problems, didn't have the fight to prove themselves and generate what we were saying early on about a couple fighting actually generates a lot of testosterone, right? It generates testosterone and estrogen. These are these hormones that are required for Balance, building balance something, yeah. yeah, yeah, and okay. being us, mm -hmm. being, being fulfilled as human beings. So, and, and, you know, you can say to somebody who does porn, "Well, I love doing porn." Yeah, you're, but you're not fulfilled in your life, you see. And they aren't. And then, then they'll go to more and more extreme versions of porn, and they have less friends, and they're more stuck on the computer, and they're more depression. There's more anxiety. There's more drug abuse. We just know that statistically, we're all going in the wrong direction. 
And part of it is inevitable because life has become so abundant. We don't have to struggle to survive. Now, that's that model. Well, do we have to go into struggle to survive? Some people believe that, you know, when there's some saying, I heard Joe Rogan say it was a good saying, something about when 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 there's problems, we become strong. And when there's no problems, we become weak. When we become weak, that creates more problems and it makes us strong. You see how it becomes a cycle. Yeah, like this that. is what you were saying about the first generation, second generation. You know, one is building, the other one is crapping on it, and the third one rebuilds, and then kind of it could start, you know. It changes. It changes. Yes. But but we, we become weak in a sense. Women weak in their ability to be happy, strong in their ability to be productive. Men becoming weak in their productivity, but strong in their uh, illusion illusion of happiness because they're taking drugs you know is it, the addiction is there the addiction to life and true intimacy is gone true intimacy is the solution but here let's talk about the survival thing from and you just see it so clearly with the rats okay they're all their survival is to get food and they're not getting food even today and we still have a a, a primitive part of our brain like a rat but more like a snake but it's a uh, that's one part of us. And we want to include that into our lives. For example, uh, the body needs to exercise, right? We all know today everybody needs to do some exercise. Why? Well, for millions of years, people were searching for food and the body's designed to move up and down on the planet for a certain number of hours every day. And if you don't do that, the body, something's wrong. We're all designed to be walking, moving the body for hours every day. So we want to compensate for that. So we have to learn compensation measures, uh, which could be some more intense exercise or something, not too intense, various types of exercise, different for different gene types, but exercise is important. Whereas in the past, just our need to survive caused us to exercise and gave us the motivation to exercise. But when you, it's like, I have the motivation to work, but if I have all the money, I have to counteract that, you know, otherwise, the design is well, why work if I don't have okay. to. Yes. So we're living in a different world where survival is no longer the major thing. Security is no longer the major thing because once you can survive and you have things, now you have to protect them. Well, we have legal systems, we have police, we have governments, we have armies. So pretty much our survival and security to a great extent is fulfilled. Uh, just to get, create a context for this, it, when I went in China, the whole idea of boys being superior to females, where did that come from? Well, boys, it was a world of, of size as might. Yeah. And so parents would have lots of children and they wanted boys because that became your police force. That became your army. There'd be these thugs of other families wanting to come take what you want. There was no order, you know? It's like you, Interesting. You had, yeah, 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 yeah. They were creating their own tribe. Mm -hmm. They were having their own tribe to protect them. And, and women were very happy to have other wives. Uh, because one man, he would have, he was the biggest, always the biggest. He'd have many, many wives, many, many sons. And now that was his army. And you could, all, everybody's feeling safe. And women didn't have any problem with, my husband's not monogamous. <laughs> you, not you back then, no. no. Mm -hmm. It was all practical. It was fulfilling a need. So the need for survival, the need for security. But now, I mean, think about security. A woman's security is primarily that your husband is monogamous. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, you're going to lose everything if he goes with another woman. And women know that youth, younger women will tend to pull in men. They knew as young women, I could pull in a man. Mm -hmm. So women are threatened by other women. So <laughs> these are all amazing dynamics. So Maslow talked about the foundation of survival, the, their hierarchy of needs. Then uh, when, when the lower needs are fulfilled, higher needs come into play. And what I'm saying is that if if we're it's not so much that in order for men and women to feel attracted to each other like the mice weren't attracted to anymore or rats were not attracted to each other because their need for survival was being fulfilled mm -hmm. okay so it was they didn't have to achieve that well once we don't have to achieve that then security becomes important then primarily emotional fulfillment becomes the primary thing like i need to feel loved and love comes in many different ways. It comes from likes on the computer. It comes from somebody clapping for me. It comes with somebody admiring me. It comes with someone who cares about me, someone who listens to me, understands where I'm coming from. Love comes in many flavors, but our primary need as a society today, which is somewhat secure and survival is ensured, is our emotional needs. That becomes the hunger. Yes. 
Yes. And if we don't realize that that is what's making us unhappy is the lack of emotional fulfillment, that's the sort, then we stop looking for emotional fulfillment. So when women stop looking for emotional fulfillment from men, they become not attracted to men. And when men stop looking for emotional fulfillment from women, they lose their attraction to women and they become gay. So this is a society of, we can't get our needs met with each other, we look to ourselves. And this is a problem. This is what's happening today with the rats and with the humans. We're seeing that the biggest problem today is men and women, they want emotional fulfillment, but they don't know how to get it. And so when you don't know how to get it, you then say, well, then if I can't get it, you you, you stop just look looking. at yourself. Yeah, you become yeah, that's very interesting because this means also that we're actually meant to be teams and confront whatever we and, need and, you know, in the, order to the research to a long time ago. There I'm not making a judgment here about gay people. I have gay friends and whatever, but there there was research that used to be available to people, which is that Gay men, generally speaking, were smothered by their mothers, did not have a father or had a weak, very weak father, almost always. Mm -hmm. But you could also be a straight male and your mother could smother you and your father's not available. It's just to the extent that your father's not available, if you're a male, your percentage of, of either gay will go up or criminal will go up. <laughs> so I've taught in the prisons and they all... I had terrible, terrible, terrible traumatic childhood. I mean, we're talking about, you know, we talked earlier about we all have trauma. Okay, we all have trauma, but extreme trauma that doesn't get healed, doesn't get resolved, turns you into a criminal. Uh, and in the other case, it can create other aberrations. And nobody is perfect. We all carry trauma, but we should have an ideal to look towards. Okay, it's, you know, one of the well, topics, mm -hmm. one of the topics around today is, should gay couples have babies? Uh, it's not an ideal, okay? But let's let what we need is the ideal of a man and a woman make a baby. That's that's the goal we shoot for for civilization, and we're wired up that way. So then you've got somebody who is gay, two gay men. There was an interview of two famous gay men, rich, and how much money it costs for them to do IV and to do and then to find someone to carry the baby and to do this and do it's. That is not a strategy for efficiency and survival. But you don't judge that person. You go, okay, well, they're free to do what they want. But you don't encourage that because it's not practical. It doesn't produce the evolution of the species. What produces the evolution of a species, we know. It's man and woman make babies. Mm -hmm. and, and they have to love each other. And they have to be hormonally in balance. Okay, that's the whole thing is hormonal balance. And hormonal balance occurs when our genes... When we have genetic balance, because what we're being thrown off of our genetic balance is we have these genes, but they have to be expressed. And if they're not expressed properly, because chemicals are coming into our body, we become confused about our sexuality. Now, while we're seeing that acted out with the young generation, even in a, a married generation, people listening to this, wanting to have better relationships and so forth, we have to recognize that there's, besides the chemicals in the environment, it is the culture today pushes women into the workforce. That is not the way we've evolved for thousands of years. If you go down, I've been down to the Amazon, live with the tribes there. The women are all pregnant. They don't have birth control. Either they're taking care of somebody else's baby or <laughs> they've got a baby. Or they have a baby and they're and expecting they're, one too. And mm -hmm. they cook and they care for the babies and they do the gardening. These are routine behaviors that don't require high expenditure of energy, but long-term expenditure of energy. See, that's the female body type. Female body type genetically has more fat cells than muscle cells. Has more endurance muscles. in that sense, has more that's endurance. Right. Women have this long endurance. Mm -hmm. Men have this, fat, you know- Sprinter, sprinter setup. Exactly, yeah. he's like the sprinter, he can push out. And then they need to collapse and relax. This is our, our genetic wiring. So the men, they go into the jungle and they sit around doing nothing until they see the animal, you know? So we can sit there and do nothing, kind of like the yogi who's meditating all the time. We're good at that. Very hard for women to do that. <laughs> Harder. But when men are on their female side, it's also hard for them to do that. And then they want to talk about their problems. And that talking about their problems makes them feel better. They, they get to feel right that somebody's validating me. And then they feel better about themselves only short term. It's like for men complaining, it's a bit like men doing pornography. 
is in both cases, it throws you out of balance. Men should not complain. Men should not whine. Men should not talk about whatever feelings they're having. They should practice sucking it up and feeling what their partner feels. So I'm not telling men not to feel. It's men, you should learn to feel what women feel. A, a bit of empathy, a bit of empathy, which might not be maybe your, you know, basic male instinct, but we actually, we actually are able to do because we have a brain to think and self-respect, uh, re reflect and introspect, and then maybe be open to whatever the partner wants to say. And that would be an evolution in behavior, but it is That's a maturity. to learn. It's a maturity and it's a learned behavior yeah. for the male side of us to feel empathy for somebody else rather than think about yourself. And But if you start to complain, what you're doing is asking someone to empathize for you rather than learning how to empathize for a woman. Therefore, women are wired up to share their emotions, to share their feelings inside. And then if you care about her and she's in pain, and this is how men learn empathy. When you care about somebody and they're in pain, then you feel empathy primarily because you care about them. You know, I see terrible things in the news all the time. And I don't shed tears, but if it happened to my daughter or my family, I would shed tears right away. You know, I'd be in a huge agony and pain to see my child going through that. But you see this stuff happening all the time in the news. We habituate to it. You see, we go numb with it. We all get numb and, and we don't react. And I can, and I choose to as a man, I will take five or 10 minutes when a terrible thing happens to focus on that. Imagine it's mine, connect with it just because I don't want to become numb to the world, but to feel the pain of what we're doing uh, as a society, what we're doing to people. Be conscious people with it. That's that that's a very, very interesting thing because you were saying something about, you know, okay, men on porn online. You know, the brain does not, apparently, does not know what is real and not. And this is why when we close our eyes and we think about biting into our lemon, we will start salivating, right? So so this this kind of, uh, I think this is very interesting. But coming back to to the rat and you knew, the rats, the experiment in your book, because I, I, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, this is kind of inevitable for the Western rich world we're talking now, that, that basically life is getting easier. It's getting more stressful because of all of these, uh, all of these um, stimuli that, that basically are onto us. Well, On it's the other paradoxical. Hand, we... Just look at, the, look at the paradox of that. Life is so much easier. You know, people say the world is so terrible now. The world has never been this good. You can pick up a phone and call somebody. You can watch movies on your screen. <laughs> you yeah, you get... don't have to move. Exactly. And you have everything right at your doorstep or in whatever. Exactly. But that's another problem. It's a whole other issue. But what I find interesting in thinking this way and about the, the, the theme of your new book is that if we continue to be basically in this in this in this nirvana all the time we will just degenerate into what if we don't have any challenge to go through it and grow through it and have that evolution and even though um you know the world is developing through technologies through its dynamics into this is it not us humans that we can consciously step back and say yes I like this, but I need to have challenges. I need to somehow, you know, still go out and not call in the pizza. You know, let me go out in the snow, whatever, you know, make it hard for me by myself. So the discipline turns in not, okay, I have to go through all of these challenges. I have to be disciplined. No, I have to put up challenges and be disciplined with that to stay a woman, to stay a man and to, to stay maybe a sane society. And here's the, here's the good news. For a man and a woman to provide emotional fulfillment has never been done in the past. It was never required in the past. It is a huge challenge. That's why we see so much divorce and people are not getting a relationship because they don't even know how to attempt to overcome that challenge. You know, for the man, you know, for the rat, their their instincts tell them how to do it. But for emotional fulfillment, it causes you have to have changed behaviors that you didn't learn in childhood. Our parents did not have the skills of providing emotional fulfillment that is required today for modern women. Modern women, one of the major sources of emotional fulfillment can be, it's not, but can be having a man as your backup, somebody you can go to and share what's going on in your life, share things that nobody, you would never talk about with anybody else, uh, have projects together where you truly care about win-win. You know, these are things you don't experience in the workplace, but particularly what women don't experience in the workplace. 
is the freedom. They experience opportunity, more and more opportunity, but not the freedom, the opportunity to share what's coming up inside of them. And now we tie this into the whole idea of everything as a trigger. Now, the trigger situation is when life gets good, then this is a paradox. There are all these paradoxes of male and female and what's going on inside of us. But the paradox here is that when life is good, then everything that was ungood in your past comes up into your awareness. But when it comes up, it doesn't say, hey, this is your unresolved feelings about mom arguing with dad or dad arguing with mom. It just comes up as I'm feeling this stress and the brain then goes and looks for reasons and it looks for reasons, well, he didn't turn out the light. That means he doesn't love me. And it, the brain just attacks that thing, that little thing that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But couples start out with little problems and then they escalate. It's because th these feelings come up. They're, because they're from the unconscious, we're not conscious of why we feel that way. So the brain is, what's causing me to feel this way? How many people have I heard who become successful go, I thought having this new car or this house or this wife would make me happy. It's not doing it. Well, actually, it did make you feel safe and feel good about yourself. So everything unlike your past comes up. It's this idea of PTSD, which has become very clear as the soldier has all this trauma in battle. You know, his friend is killed. He actually kills another human being. This is not high consciousness here, but you have to do it. So there's all this suppression, you know, when there's danger, if you let yourself experience fear, which means get out of here, what, what you end up doing is suppressing all your emotions of danger. But when you come back into where you're safe, this is where the trauma happens, is when they come back and they feel relaxed and safe, then they feel very, very unhappy. And the only way they can feel good again is to suppress those feelings. And the way they suppress those feelings is doing something dangerous. That it's is dangerous. so... Exactly. To, to evoke, so they're creating their own problems. And there's two things that, that come to my mind. And that is, for example, how to, for example, uh, like Roger Federer. Okay. He's one of the most successful, long standing um, tennis players, Swiss guy, uh, lives here where, where we live. Um, and, you know, to have this win and another win and still keep the motivation up because they've done it. They fought, they've done it. They could have kind of like, oh, I'm so good. No. The next, you know, after after a tournament is before a tournament or Beyonce uh, having, you know, 32 Grammys and she relentlessly continues. She just could relax and just degenerate into her, you know, I'm so good. But no, no, no. She continues to impose the next challenge. Yeah, I want to have another Grammy. I want to have another project with African music. I want to have this, that and the other, which is, you know, which is, I think, the secret also, which which makes us then elevated human beings that we go like okay i had a win bye i'm gone and just drown in champagne for the rest of my life or go like yeah i have a win but i can do more and i want to do more and it's not about the win it's actually about overcoming and beating and practicing to beat my opponent in whatever race or game or you know uh award show yes <laughs> 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 good. <laughs> good. We cleared that one. I'll tell you what comes up as I'm listening and, and, and wanting to understand what you're saying. And I see that is that is a challenge once you made it to the top of the mountain to keep climbing to a higher mountain. Exactly. Uh, in my own life, uh, I climbed to the top. I was the historically best selling author as far as New York Times for like four and a half years uh, every Sunday. I'm number one. I'm number one. I'm number one. I'm number one. I mean, it's situation. <laughs> Thank you. But it, it no longer became the first time when I was number one. It was like I really, really wanted orgasmic, it. orgasmic. Yeah. I mm -hmm. continue to be driven by. So for me, what drives me today is not what I want. I have everything I've ever wanted, but what drives me today is being aware I'm needed. And this is, a, this is a very masculine thing. And so I was, as you're talking, I'm considering the female side of it uh, in a different way, maybe. But I know for me, my motivation comes with an awareness of how I'm needed. And that's why my message is so helpful for to men at any stage of their success. It's ultimately the soul of a man needs meaning. Now, women need meaning too, but men need it more, okay? This is why you see all these males that are not motivated. They don't know what their meaning is. No purpose, yeah. Mm -hmm. If they had a father who was needed by a mother, then they would know that men are needed, and that gives us meaning. And when something has meaning, 
then it produces the right hormonal balance for us. Okay, for women, it's more the opportunity uh, to get what they need. So this is a big di distinction, which opportunity to get what I need. And what I could see with Beyonce, which maybe it's functional, maybe it's not functional. The way I look at her videos, it's not functional at all. She's selling sex and she's misleading a whole generation of girls to use their body to get attention. You know, kind of like those rats. Uh, the females just become obsessed with who they are and taking pictures of themselves and look at me and look at this and whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. So th there's an agenda behind Beyonce, uh, which supports that the agenda, which goes the wrong direction, supports that what I'll call promiscuous behavior. It's just simply Sodom and Gomorrah. It's disgusting to me. Mm -hmm. If I was not anchored in my own healthy, monogamous, loving relationship, I would be aroused by it. I, I, I was just watching some of it again. I was just saying my maturity, I was sort of being proud of myself of my maturity. <laughs> and when I see all this behavior, which is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah behavior, and it's off -putting. sexual aberration, disgusting mm -hmm. behavior, uh, I was uh, not turned on by it in the slightest, you know. <laughs> It's like, what are they doing? Why are these people watching this? And and I, I have to admire, I wa watched some, I was looking at the review of the Grammys and there was one of these really well, well successful male uh, actors and everybody was like dancing along with it. And he was just like, this is the most boring thing. What are these sick people? <laughs> Good for him. You know, it was just wonderful. Ben Affleck, Ben Affleck. Okay. Oh, Here was Ben Affleck, a Hollywood go go god. And they zoomed over the hand and said, well, he's not having a good time. And I, I, I wouldn't be having a good time either. It's like, why can I get out of this place? This is just like disgusting. It's like, but when I'm a younger man, if I went into a strip bar, I would get turned on. Now I just see it as dirty and sleazy. And that's what was called dirty. It's, it's sexual sensu it's sensuality without love. Yes. You see, making love is the proper description of adult sex. Okay, anything less than that is depleting you of your humanity, putting you as an animal, which is addicted to sex. And even animals don't have sex all that time. Yes. They will only do it to make babies. What we do is nature has made sex and certain sex organs and right stimulation very pleasurable, so we'll reproduce. Okay, the whole point of the pleasure is get these people to reproduce, get them to create that attraction. But then as a higher mind come in, our more hum human prefrontal cortex activity, pineal gland activity, intelligence of the universe comes into us. You want to be aligned with what brings us to higher level of fulfillment. It's use your sex. And I'm talking to the men here, particularly use the pleasure you feel not to intensify pleasure. It will go up by itself. If you use the pleasure to feel and express more caring, loving words and behaviors. Is it shit? See, I didn't know this as a young guy. I was just like doing it and wanting to create intensity, whatever. And, you know, because I love my partner, still wasn't depleting of me. But you can grow so much in your ability to love if you keep feeling this, the, the pleasure. Because, see, pleasure allows men to feel. Men don't have access to feelings the way women do, unless they're too, unless they're out of balance. And when they're out of balance, what they feel is always negative and complaining and picky and, and irritable and mad. This is emotions come from estrogen. And when men have more estrogen than testosterone, their emotions are always negative. When men have strong testosterone and estrogen, then you are like selfless and giving and nurturing and confident at the same time. And you're capable of feeling empathy for another rather than just going, yes, I know how you feel and feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> yeah. this, this, but and, exactly. But, but, but following your thought, you, what you were saying that experiencing emotions for men is different than for women. And it starts more physical and then should elevate into the speaking, the feeling, the, you know, the empathy, whereas women start perhaps with a, you know, I don't know, neurological kind of stimulation to then go more into physical and then make love. Is that, yeah, do I understand we know that, that right? When, when they've done the research, this is well researched out that men are visually stimulated. You yep. see your brains to get sexual. For women, it's more verbal. It's all verbal. And if we could understand this in our sex lives as well, uh, have a conversation, be horror beforehand if you haven't done this. But generally speaking, men are quite quiet during sex. And this is the best time to express your love for your partner. Things like, I'm. This you, I say this a million times, I'm so lucky I married you. 
You're the most beautiful woman at the party tonight. I love working hard because I know that we can go on that vacation together. <laughs> it's this sounds corny, but this is this is women live for this. And this Absolutely. is the thing. It ticks and, the boxes and, with women for sure. In my workshops, I will start saying these things. I'll, I'll tell them, man, these are some things you can say during sex. And I go to the list and the, if it's authentic for you, and sometimes they have to adjust the words and whatever, but for their authentic feelings. And to say these things out loud. And all the men are going, this is stupid. Why would I say these things? But I, I, I know what they're feeling because I'm a man. And then I say, now, how many women would love to hear that in the middle of making love? They already, <laughs> their hands go up so much. Now, so men are not aware of that. But there's a flip side to this. Now, the flip side to this is something that men don't know they need to hear. They don't want to hear it, but they don't know they need to hear it. So we need to learn, understand a little bit more about women is that inside of women, and part of what marriage does is provide a sense of security for women uh, because estrogen is more emotional. More, so there's more fear inside. Now, that fear is always wanting to get reassurance. And so every time a woman is upset, a part of her is afraid you don't love me, afraid our relationship is getting worse. I mean, it just is always, always that way. Now, she may not know that because that's what I do in therapy. And that's just what we're talking about in therapy. When a woman comes in, she has her feelings. I have to use her feelings to come back to feeling her emotions. And then let's say she feels hurt. That's the universal go-to feeling for women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Society, psychology is like, I feel hurt. Okay, so you feel hurt. But you can't, and, and if you can't just feel hurt and let it go, it, and they can't, it's because they're also feeling other emotions. Like, I'm sad. I feel alone. Uh, I feel angry. He's ignoring me. I feel sad that other people have this. I don't have this. I feel sorry that I picked the wrong person. I'll never get what I want. See, there's always an iceberg emotion. See, what you feel, if you're having negative emotions and they don't go away quickly, two things are happening. One is your past is coming up, but that's the second reason. The first reason is when you're upset about something, if I'm frustrated, I'm also disappointed. Yes. You can't feel frustration for more than a few minutes unless you sink in deeper. Well, this is not what I expected to happen. I expected it to be so much easier. So now I'm feeling disappointed. But people will just stay stuck in their frustration. And just talking about frustration will not make it go away. You've got to go from talking about frustration. Now, what were your, what's your disappointment here? What no, to, and then to expectations. Why did you have these expectations in the first it, place? It's setting you up for disappointment, John, no? setting it up. And this is where you have to learn to accept what you cannot change and have the courage to change what you can, okay? But it's not just the courage to change what you can. It's the wisdom to know what you can do. And we don't have that wisdom because we haven't had any training on how we can get the support we need when it comes to men and women in relationships in this new era of seeking emotional support. So... But underneath sadness, if sadness doesn't go right away and people can be stuck feeling sad, feeling sorry for themselves, then why are they stuck in it? Because they're also in the subconscious mind, they're also afraid. Mm -hmm. See, there's, there's, if somebody's sad, you know, that a picture didn't happen the way they want, then underneath that, if that doesn't go away quickly, negative emotions will go away quickly unless there's other emotions you're not willing to look at. So, gee, I didn't get my bestseller. I feel so sad. I thought it was happening. Well, why do I keep feeling sad and depressed? Because I'm not aware of another emotion inside, which could be, well, I'm afraid I will never have success. I'm afraid no one will ever want to be with me. I'm a, See, we have to look at these fears, but somebody could just be angry on the surface and then disappointed and sad, and then underneath that is fear. And then if you go even deeper, many times what you're feeling is regret. I should have done this and I didn't do that. And it's really my fault. And you, you have to be honest with the layers of emotion. So that's why I do in therapy is I help women become aware of the layers. And I have to do it for them first because they just don't know that they think these things. You know, people say, I know what I think. No, you don't. If you're upset, you do not know what's inside because awareness on deeper levels, things will release, things will let go. And then you'd be more clear about what I really, really want. And what I always want as human beings is to love we want to love and be loved. And this is what I want. Not just I want to be loved, but I want to be loving. Yes. Uh, and ironically, when you're angry at somebody, you're actually wanting to love them. Okay. You're wanting harmony to happen. You know, a uh, crazy thing about men is when men are, when men are violent, they have been in the past and sometimes are. If you ask them, what do you want? 
I want to kill the demon inside of her so that she'll love me. <laughs> okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it gets very specific. I can imagine, yeah. yeah. And, and so we, we think negative emotions will achieve our goals. They will never help us achieve our goals. And the more we use our negative emotions to choose change, to achieve our goals, they become an automatic go-to. Oh, if I'm not getting what I want, what negative emotions do I have? And you go right to those negative emotions as opposed to, well, what do you do with these negative emotions? Mm -hmm. Understand why we have them if we're human. As an animal, you use negative emotions to manipulate. Uh, for example, uh, I, I had a little hummingbird in my house yesterday and got caught in the room and I had to put it in a jar and take it outside. Mm -hmm. As soon as it saw that I put the jar over it, it appeared to be dead. It went into fake and fold, okay, or freeze. Yeah, uh, this is the triple it was a stress F, yeah. response. Yeah. And it was amazing. It even showed one wing. Uh, it's just it's to show like it, its wing was broken and it couldn't fly anymore. Oh my God. It was just playing dead. As soon as I put it out, it's like, psh, gone. It was, it was, but the, we have these instinctive reactions inside fight, flight, fold, fake, freeze. There are all these different genetic programmings we have when we're not getting what we want. And when you use those programmings to get what you want, they become stronger. And as human beings, we use anger is always to intimidate. And sadness is to get get sympathy from others so they'll do things for us. Uh, fear is so that you don't have to do it. Other people will do it for you. And regret, feeling, oh, I'm so sorry, is to win people's trust. See, they really do care. So these are all manipulations, all negative emotions. And if you use it to get those things, whether you're conscious of it or not, they just get stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah, and you, you feed you feed the bad wolf there, absolutely, because it worked maybe as a child. You were stomping your foot, you were That's crying, right. you were angry, you you kind of lashed out, and your parents gave you whatever you wanted just to not be humiliated on the street or accused of you know mistreating the child so or whatever you. So it's not good to express them, but then people go, if it's not good to express them, then all I can do is suppress them. No, what you can do is explore them consciously and express them in a context context where you're not trying to change someone but you're you're expressing them so you have greater awareness of what's inside so you can let it go then what happens is the wiring in the brain gradually shrinks using negative emotion to get what you want and instead what what grows is empathy for yourself which then eventually becomes empathy for others no, and that, is, that's called emotional processing. And exactly. so my books talk about that. A good therapist can do that. But if the therapist can't do it for themselves, they cannot do it for somebody else. It's for somebody else. I, mean, I think we might have to have a session about you, John, and what, what makes a good therapist or a good emotional relationship coach. Um, well, listen, uh, I, I think I we, we answered one of the main so questions. Fast, but we, we all started out. <laughs> let me finish up a thought here, which is when you're not liking your partner, all right, the wall is built around you. I mean, if you're really done, you know, there's one thing if I don't like my partner and you're upset about it, but another one is I just don't like them. There's no emotional charge at all. That means you've gone through your resistance, you've gone through your resentment, you've gone through your rejection of them, but you stayed and you allowed things to stay the same. And then those feelings just get repressed and they're not there. And that's one brick. And then it comes back, another brick, another brick. And a, so basically a good therapy or a good self-help program is to recognize your relationship will always get you in touch with your bricks. So every time there's an upset, use that upset to process your emotions, come back to love. And you can, you can come back because love is always there. Uh, if you say to me, feel, if I say to everybody now, right now, it's really important, but feel your right foot. Uh, <laughs> You weren't aware of it, but right now you are. Yes, it's uh, a focus so you, thing. Yeah. You can find the love if you have the intention to find it and the right understanding after you've expressed the negative, kind of like a big argument, then you can now get in touch with the love and the attraction. It's just that's not a healthy way to get back to love. Just like war is not a healthy way to find peace. Peace. Yeah. Because if war is the way to achieve peace, mm -hmm. then to sustain peace, you have to keep creating war. So it's just a simple side. If you use negative emotion to find love and big arguments, then you have to have big arguments to bring some passion back into the relationship 
over time you just so go it cycles it you cycles you get young i mean at the end of the day it's not so good when it comes to peace and war but certainly you know with the ups and downs and the reason to communicate or not to overcome or not it's very interesting dynamics john i will have to let you go but before i let you go i know there is a live relationship weekend coming up march 4th and 5th and um i saw it uh, advertised on your website and i think we need to mention it because this is where people i think get in touch directly with you and your magic as as a, a therapist as a coach and somebody that just can empathetically listen especially to women not only men so um we'll talk about this one and i think as i said we go on through one of the questions of the many questions that my community has so uh, i can't wait to have you back and talk a little bit more i mean one of the question was what what i thought was very interesting for example why do we always fall in love with the same asshole type <laughs> so it's very very rude question but real simple answer real simple well, we can go further into it but the real simple is we fall in love with the wrong people because we have trust issues okay we have trust issues if you have a trust issue meaning you couldn't trust your father or such traumas happen in your past what happens is a reversal we will tend to depend upon the people who are wrong And if you depend on people who are wrong, you're not attracted to people who are right. So that's one of the answers to it. It's called a trust issue. Usually it's a father issue with women. I think you're talking about women in this case, uh, where you fall in love with the wrong person. It's literally like you have a magnet to be attracted to the person who can't give you love so that you get to be this childhood neurosis of trying to get people to love you rather than actually feeling relaxed and open and attracted to somebody who can. And so therapy helps with that, but also behavior changes can help solve that problem, which we can talk about another time. We will. We will. I can't wait. John, thank you so much again for being with us here on Mentory TV uh, at the beginning of this 2023. So we've got a many, uh, hopefully many more conversations with you coming up. Thank you so much. And well, dear Mentory TV community, um, we're going to go through all of your questions that keep coming in every time when Dr. John Gray is on. Make sure to follow us. And John, I'm really excited. Hopefully the next book's coming out soon. And yes, don't get habituated. I want you back on the bestseller list. I don't know how many weeks. All the best to you and see you soon. Bye. Thank you.